It's the only offensive weapon that you have, though. Did you know that? Every other piece of the armor of God is defensive. Every other piece of it, from the belt to the breastplate to the shield, it's all defensive. And this one, the sword of the Spirit, is the only offensive weapon that you have. Now, we're going to dive into a few things uh, this week about sword, spirit, and word. Those are three words that we're really going to dive into, is understanding what the sword is, understanding what the Spirit is, and then understanding what the word, word means. (laughs) Yeah, that's a little bit complicated. Write that one down in your notes and see if you can understand it in a week. The word, word means... So as we're talking about this sword of the spirit thing, I want to, I want to give a few qualifiers before we jump into Ephesians 6, okay? The number one thing is when I say sword and I hold up a physical real sword right here in front of you, do not think, everybody on YouTube as well, we are not talking about attacking any one individual because we've been saying this all throughout the session. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are not the enemy. Honey, you may want to set a few rows back on that. <laughs> you are not the enemy. Say it again. Say, you are not the enemy. So we're not fighting against flesh and blood. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says the weapons of our warfare are not of this world. They're not carnal. They're not a natural thing, but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. This is all a spiritual battle that we're in, not a physical battle. So when we talk about all this armor, we have nothing, it's nothing against the individual. No matter who they are, what creed they come from, this is a spiritual battle that we're fighting against. And this battle really has to do more within yourself than it does to do against any one thing. See, the interesting thing is, is it's first you've got to battle yourself, then you can take on the enemy. But a lot of us, the enemy is ourself. So you you can't even see the outside enemy until you get over battling yourself. And that's why every piece of the armor is so important. I recommend you to go back and watch those again. I'm just plugging those like consistently because otherwise uh, you're going to miss something. So, but Isaiah 54, 17 says this, what? No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Okay. Now again, this weapon, if I take a gun and shoot you in the natural, it will prosper. What does prosper means? It will succeed. Right? This is not talking about natural weapons. It's saying, hey, no weapon in the spiritual realm can prosper against you if, if is the biggest word ever in our language, if you've got this armor of God on over here, right? If you stand there. Now, you have a weapon that is forged and can succeed and will succeed. I love that that new song. I I sang it at the end uh, horribly because it was a little too high. I sang it in the other key last night. (laughs) Realize that after the fact, I was like, commit, we're going to do it. <laughs> but it talks about how that, <laughs> that no weapon formed will prosper because my God only knows how to conquer. That's all he knows. You ever met somebody that's never failed at anything? Like, you know, they're like, oh, they just had it made. And then they do something and they fail and it just completely breaks, breaks their heart, breaks their little heart. That's not our God because he doesn't fail. Matter of fact, he really can't fail because if he said, hey, I'm not going to, he just doesn't, he just does what he wants. Kind of like some of your kids. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) So it is something that will prosper. This sword is the most important piece that you have of the armor. But the sword is only good if you've got the rest of the armor on. This sword is contingent, and you're going to see that by the end of it, 100% on the rest of the armor because oh i'm I'm, I'm gonna give it away okay so i'm gonna put this in my little sheath here all right so let's go shall we everybody understand it's not a physical battle okay all right ephesians 6 10 we're gonna read it from the beginning you guys should like be going to bed saying this scripture in your head right here it says finally brother be strong in the lord and the power of his might put on the whole armor of god that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Again, I refer back to the first and second sessions. That's when we really dove into all of this stuff. Verse 13, therefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand... Verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, having your the breast... Ble- blah, 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 blah. The breastplate of righteousness. There we go. Got that out someday or another. Verse 15, and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 
Verse 16, and above all, taking the shield of faith. Oh, that was a good one. The shield of faith, where you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. 17 is where we're going to live a little bit this, this morning. And verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. That was last week. And we stopped right there, left you on the cliffhanger of what the rest of verse 17 said, as if you couldn't continue to read yourself. And verse 17 says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, I find it interesting that it says sword of the spirit. Every other one says breastplate of righteousness and then just continues to move on. Maybe says what it's for. But this one tells you a little bit more definitively what it is. It says it's the sword of the spirit. But then it goes ahead and says, which is, just in case you don't know what the sword of the spirit is and what the spirit is, which is the word of God. Now, we're going to define those three words that I talked about. That's a really, really key point. Now, the first thing we have to look at is the word sword. So, right, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. A sword is an interesting thing. There's so many different types of swords. You guys know this? I did a little research on how many different types of swords there were. Right? We, we always probably think of this type of sword, like a Knight's Templar sword or something like that. But in the Roman time periods, they had a couple of different swords that they would carry, actually. They had some short ones. They had some long ones. But the most important thing, one of the biggest pieces of a sword that began to arise back in those days was a, what's called a double-edged sword. So this would be considered a double-edged sword. Because it has two edges. It's not just sharp on one side, it's sharp on the other. Now, all throughout Scripture, you see this thing, double-edged, double-edged sword, double-edged sword. It's talking about, it's an analogy, right? Again, everything is showing us something in the natural that we can understand in the spiritual realm. And what it's showing us is that there's, there's two sides to it. Two sides to it all the time. And if you look in Hebrews, that's where we're, we're going to read this one real quick. It's Hebrews 4.12. And Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is quick. And powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, and to the joints and the marrow, and to the discerning of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, I'm gonna unpack a little bit of this for you here. What this is talking about in double edged sword, and you'll see this throughout scripture, it uses the, the concept of a double edged sword is that there's two sides. And if you read that, it says it's to discern, it's to separate things. Think of it like this. It cuts going in, but heals coming out. It's used for two purposes. It may not feel the greatest. I've had a surgery. I don't know what it felt like because I was knocked out, thank goodness. But had I been awake, everybody would have known I was probably having surgery. I'd probably been screaming like a little girl. Why? Because it was cutting in and it didn't feel good. I'm sure, right, who's ever, who's ever had something like a cut on your arm and it doesn't feel good. And even the antiseptic and stuff that you put on it to heal, it kind of it doesn't feel great. But man, once it's, once it's sewn back up, once it's put back together. So think of like a surgeon's scalpel. It's not like a blunt blade that, we're, that the Spirit of God just going around, Wah! and lopping off people's heads. Y'all thought I was going to let that go. Mike got a little scared right there. I had two hands on it, two hands, right? It's, it's like a surgeon's scalpel. He's going in and saying, hey, I need to divide this, this thing, the bone and the marrow. I need to separate out these things so we can look at the intent of the heart. Because the Spirit of God is going to come and is going to be like that double-edged sword. It's going to come in and separate some things. But you notice what it says is doing the separating and the dealing with the intent of the heart? The Word of God. So I want you to look at your neighbor and say, you're not the Word of God. It's not your job, people. It is not your job to go around and dividing and saying, JR, we don't wear yellow shirts at this church. And Taryn, honey, you knew better. And no sleeves on that thing. It is not, you know, I'm using ridiculous examples, guys, obviously. But what, what, what do we do? Hey, you know, their life's really, they're not making some good decisions. I need to go let them know. Right? The only people, by the way, you have the right to let know is people you have a relationship with, just so you know. But... Whose job is it? It's the Word of God. We're going to define this and understand it a little bit. But it's not your job. It's the Spirit's job to do that. Okay? So let's continue on. So it's the only offensive weapon, but it's called the sword of the what? Spirit. This is a huge word. It's all throughout Scripture. Imagine that. The word spirit in this context is the word pneuma. That's where we get pneumonia from. Because the word pneuma means breath. It means breath. It means to blow. It means like wind. But I loved this definition that I read, and it means this right here. The act that keeps one alive, breathing. That was pretty cool to me. 
The sword of the act that keeps you alive. Now, again, this is not in the natural. This is a spiritual. That keeps you spiritually alive is this weapon that you have. The only offensive thing, which is the sword, that will divide things up in your life. It's its responsibility. And it's the breath, the thing that will keep you alive and going. Okay? That's what the word spirit means all throughout. Did you know that? The word spirit everywhere translates back. In the Hebrew, it's the word ruah. Ruah kind of sounds like, you know, military, you know. It's the word ruah, and it means breath. Now, to understand spirit, we're going to dive all the way back to Genesis to understand this. Because in Genesis, we see the first time the word spirit ever occurs. And it's Genesis 1-1. And I will quote that for you right here. Because I've read this a thousand million times, and it is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. You should read it. In Genesis, I was about to say Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1. nope. Uh, <laughs> Genesis 1.1 1, 1 says this right here. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness came upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. Now, again, Acts of Worship, session 1.1, talks in de depth about this. So if you want to dive in and look at all the details, uh, watch that session. It's about 10 minutes long. Really, you can watch that on your way to work. But Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. That word spirit literally means breath. The breath of God moved across the face of water, and then God said. So we see a little bit. We would think, well, if it's breath, spirit, and then he said. Again, I can't go into all that today, but there's a difference in, in the breath and the spirit of God and then God accomplishing it. He brings in the accomplishment because he breathed his spirit into it. So we see spirit arriving the first time as breath. Now, the next thing that we see is in Genesis 1.26. This is the creation of man. In Genesis 1.26, here's how it says it. And God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. In verse 27, so God created man in his own image, and in his own likeness created he them, male and female created he them. So God creates man, and what does he do? He gives us dominion over everything. Now, if you keep reading, in chapter 2, it says, And God breathed his breath, or his spirit, into man. I want to do a quick little definition. I have to define all this, otherwise the sword of the spirit just sounds like, Yeah, spirit! Woo! But we got to understand here. Okay? So, God said, creates, and breathes his spirit into man. But he does something interesting. He creates us in his image and likeness. Okay? Image and likeness are two different words. Image is like a vessel. It's like formed in the shape of. But likeness is a characteristic. Okay? For instance, Mike and I are formed in the same image. Right? We have two arms. Two Two fingers. Oh, I hope I have more than two fingers. <laughs> Playing with this thing, I may not. <laughs> I have ten fingers, right? We have two legs. We have generally all the same body parts, but our characteristics are very, very starkly different. He's got more gray hair than me. <laughs> right? We've got different characteristics. Our skin tone's a little different. We think differently. We say different things. His are probably better than mine. We do and say a lot of different things because our characteristics are different. There's a big important understanding that when God created us, he breathed his breath. So he formed us in his image, and then he filled us up with his spirit, his breath, who he was, his characteristics, and said, that's how you're created. Then something happens. I won't go through all the details of this. Then we do something that's commonly fall, referred to as the fall of man. Okay, let me just really summarize this in a really quick way. When man sinned, missed the mark, everybody's aware, that's what that means, is to miss the mark. We didn't do the intended purpose. All we did was said, <sighs> and blew out all the breath, all the spirit. And from that moment on, God made a game plan. His name was Jesus. And he said, let me put that spirit back into you because it's your weapon. And without your weapon, you're not going to be much good. You know, an army can only advance so far if it had all the armor on, but had no weapons to actually fight back. That's kind of like, let's send our army out to win a war and say, hey, you get no bullets for your guns. How smart is that? 
idiot, right? No, you don't send somebody out into battle without a weapon. No matter how much defense you have, at some point there becomes an offense. And that's what the Spirit of God is. And when we were created, we had it. We were in this stance and fully filled with the Spirit of God. We stepped away from that. All we did was step out of that standing and went, (gasps) everybody take a deep breath. Now let every bit of air out of your body. Don't stop until you're done breathing. Just keep going. Force it out, force it out, force it out. Y'all are not doing it. You're not paying. People. Yeah, see? (coughs) What do you do immediately after that? Deep breaths. Right? Anytime, right, you're having something going on, what do people say? Calm down, calm down. Take a deep breath. Every time you breathe, every every time you recognize that you're remembering you're breathing this week, because you know you do that involuntary, just think, Spirit of God. Spirit of God. Now, is it the literal, literal oxygen that you're breathing? No. Again, this is likening it unto how much do you need air? Let's do an analogy. How long can you live without food? Give or take 30 days, somewhere around there probably, right? How long can you live without water? Three days, give or take. Unless you're my wife, you can't live couple hours we got to eat constantly otherwise she gets hangry so (laughs) see I told you I pick on her even when she's in here (laughs) so how long can you live without water three days let's see how long you can live without air most of us would not make it to the end of my sentence because we would already be even the most trained person can only hold it for minutes you know no one's like hey I can hold my breath for an hour no You can put some gills on, try to be a fish all you want. You're not breathing water. You need air. You need breath. That's showing us the importance of the Spirit of God and this sword, this weapon that we have. It is the breath. It is the very thing that keeps you alive. It's the environment you were created in. Eden, put a little plug in for that. You can go research that later. So that's the Spirit. So we were created in it, full of it. We fell out of it. Jesus came and brought it back to us. This is what in Acts happens. It's called the day of Pentecost, where it says that he will send the comforter. It's called the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. Same word, breath, the holy breath. Holy means it's the word kadosh in the, in the Hebrew, and it means set apart for a specific use. You ever heard the, the, the right tool for the job, right? That makes a world of difference. Someone says, give you a hammer, they give you a, a wrench, can you bang on stuff with a wrench? Sure, but can you nail a nail in straight with a wrench? If you're JR, probably, but the rest of us cannot. We need a hammer. You need the right tool for the job, but you have to use it in the right way. And so he fills us back. He brought the Holy Spirit, the one that was set apart, the breath, and said, now it's among all men. Everyone can have this breath back in you. Okay, cool. Everybody knows now what the sword of the Spirit is. Now it says this thing, which is the word of of God. Now, the word word is two words, word. It's a riddle. It's not. There's a word. I, I, there is a, um, a combination of letters. <laughs> There's no other way to describe it. But in scripture, you see two words for the word word. There's one called logos, or I don't know if that's how I'd logos. I would pronounce it logos, but you know, however you want to pronounce it. And then there's one rhema, Two different words. They mean two different things. We understand it as this. Written language and spoken language. So oral language, right? So we use it, we say it, and then it's written down. There's a difference in the two. Because when we hear the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, how many people just thought, Bible, boop, right? That's what we all think of. Because it's called the what? Word of God, which is 100% true, by the way. That is the Word of God. But it is the recorded or written word, which is the word logos, or logos, however you want to say it, right? So that is written, recorded word. But then there's this other part, which is rhema word, which means spoken word of God. So there's two different aspects, right? Just like right now, I'm speaking to you, but I also have written word of Jared. Here's written word of Jared. Here's spoken word of Jared. Do they say the same things? If I stay on track and on my notes, yes. If I do not, no. But there's this interesting thing that happens. Because you have the breath, the Spirit of God in you, you have the ability to speak and say the Word of God. Now, okay, I'm going to get a little ahead of myself. I can't go there yet. Okay, let's, let's go back here. So two, which one is used right here when it says the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God? That word is rhema. 
spoken word of God. So the sword of the Spirit, the weapon that you have, the only offensive weapon you have, that is this sword that can divide, divide things up in your life. It's its responsibility. And then it can come in and create breath and life. That is the spoken word of God. Now, how do you know what to speak? It's what Scripture is for. Right? Scripture is to keep sure and make sure that what you're saying in the Spirit is what God said. That's why, guys, it is extremely important to have all the rest of the armor on. Because let's think about this for a second. If I've got this sword of the Spirit right here, and I've got my belt of truth on, and I've got my breastplate of righteousness on, I've got my shoes of peace on, and I've got my, breastplate, or my uh, shield of faith on, and I've got my helmet of salvation on, this thing gets used in a much different way. But let's just get real for a second here. If I've got man's armor on over here, remember we talked about this in all the other sessions, what's the opposite of truth? Lying. Saying not what God says about you, saying something else what God says about you, or not saying what God said about those other people because he says he loves all the children of the world, bread and yellow polka dot, but you say, no, he doesn't. S lying is saying the opposite of the truth, which is what God said. He, can, he just wants to come on up here and teach. It's all right. So let's say you have man's belt on. Let's say you have man's breastplate of righteousness on, right? Let's say you have man's shoes of worry and doubt on. Let's say you have man's shield of not so much faith, but of worry and doubt and, and all of this other stuff. And let's say you don't put that helmet on and your thoughts are running wild because you haven't done what it said, which was to keep it all in captivity. Now what's this thing going to be used for? Because you have a spirit, whether or not it's God's spirit or not, that's really menacing to point that at you, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you've got it. <laughs> but right, you've got a spirit, whether you align it up and whether you say you use the sword of the spirit, the word of God, or not, you're still a speaking spirit. You're still going to create something. We're made in the image and likeness of God. What's the first thing God did? He created something. You have creative power in you. Whether you like it or not, you will create something in your life. Those things start from in here and come out here. Or from in here and come out here. There's scripture after scripture that says, after, at, after the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So what's in here? That's why you got to have the helmet of salvation on. Renewed mind, right? If you don't have that on, all of a sudden you're swinging this thing in the whole wrong way. It's the wrong form. You know, a sword is only so good if you have the right form when you're swinging it and using it. Just like a gun, right? We, we know guns more than swords. When, if you've ever fired a handgun, you know, you see it in the movies and they're like, ka 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 or whatever. No, it doesn't work that way. It will jam up fairly immediately unless you have a good grip to where when the kickback happens, because it uses gravity to do it. I don't know a lot about guns, but I know a little bit about it. But you've got to have a good, firm grip on it. If you're, if you're using it in the wrong manner, it's going to jam up on you. If you're sword and you don't hold it in the right thing, it's going to get knocked out of your hand and you're going to go, ah! I just did that for dramatic effect. <laughs> right? If you don't have the right form, you're using it in the wrong way. Now all of a sudden you're looking at everybody and say, they are the enemy because they said this about me. And you are creating things in your mind. You're saying it out there. All this, this is where gossip comes from, by the way. It's just simply standing over here in man's armor and using the spirit of God that he gave you, but not lining it up with what God said originally. All you got to do is say, I'm taking off this armor. I'm putting that down. I'm coming over here. I'm going to put on every other piece of the armor because when I do that, now my sword of the spirit works the right way. I can say what God says. I can create what God said I create because you are a creative spirit. You're words have power. Even the world understands this, right? Who's ever heard of the power of positive thinking? Straight up plagiarized the Bible, guys. That's what that is. They straight up took what God did and said, plagiarized it, made it a little bit sound a little different, said it's the power of positive thinking. No, God said, I made you that way. How you choose to use it is up to you. Even the world understands this, but here we are in the church saying, no, you better get your life right before you get this. You can't have the spirit of God unless you get your life right. right. No, God says, just put on the armor, change your thinking, and watch how I can put this thing in your hand. Watch how I can teach you the form. Watch how I can do that if you say what I say, if you do what I do. And I gave it to you in a book called the Bible. Because once you learn how God's characteristics, his likeness, all of a sudden you can start to see things in, in differently. You start to think of things differently. You look at people differently. Okay, well, I got really excited there for a second. Okay. <laughs> yeah, breathe. Oh, okay, there we go. So, your words have power. How do we know this? Let me just give you a couple qualifiers. I like qualifiers to make sure y'all don't think I'm lying because I got my belt of truth on up here, guys. Proverbs 18, 21. 
How do I know that your words have power and that that is the Spirit? Because the word Spirit is breath. And Proverbs 18.21 says, Life and death are in the power of the tongue. You have the ability to create life and death in your tongue. Now, it's not Star Wars style where we're like Darth Vader and, you know, like that. But like this right here. One of the most common examples that people have this with is who has a boss that is like the worst boss ever. We won't show of hands so it's not on YouTube and people find out, right? What do we deem as a bad boss or a bad leader? Typically someone who doesn't inspire us. Typically someone who doesn't really make us want to do our, our good work. You know, my dad never once, my dad was a hard dude, but he never once said, Jared, you did that wrong. You're worthless. You're not going to amount to anything. I can't believe you, you idiot. Well, he did call me an idiot a few times. Uh, <laughs> I retract. If you saw what I did, it was pretty idiotic. So, But right, no, he encouraged me. I've been teaching my, my kids uh, music, okay? And little Levi is trying to learn the drums. Well, he's not even taller than the bass drum, hardly, and he can't really reach the pedal, and he's trying, and he's not in timing, and it's all over the place, but he's trying everything. What, what would possess me to create death in that situation, to kill his spirit and want to do music if I said, Levi, if you don't get it right this time, by God? No. Why? Because you have the power to create that, to create thoughts in someone else's head, to create thoughts in your own mind. You know, you have to say it to yourself. Say it to yourself constantly, because that's how you begin to use the sword of the Spirit. And then you can say it to other people. And then, once you start to understand that, now you can start using it against the enemy. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Now, Matthew 15, 11 is another one. This is an interesting one if you read through the whole, the whole passage here in, in Matthew 15, 11. But it says that it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out. And what comes out of a man is... What he says, it's not what goes into you, so it's not anything you can consume, it's not anything you do, it's what you start to say that will defile and create the path of your life, derivative from what God has originally intended for you, because you were using your weapon the wrong way. You picked up the different sword, not the sword of God's spirit, but the sword of your own will. That's why Jesus prayed in Matthew when he was praying the Lord's Prayer, he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Everybody believe your words have power now? So isn't this all well and good that we understand what a sword is for? It can cut and it can divide, it can do that. And, and we understand what spirit is, it's the breath, it's the very thing that keeps you alive. And that we have that breath and we have that ability to speak things into existence. I can't tell you how many conversations I have with people and what I hear immediately is, oh, this is just going so rough and bad and this, that and the other. And then they say this. But I know God will work it out. But it's just so bad. Well, you just defeated what you said. Tell the situation, this is how it is. Now, there's a difference, okay? I'm going to use this, this verse in a minute, okay? There's a difference in calling something that be not as though it were and something that is as though it be not. One is lying and the other is calling something in its place, okay? So if I said, Levi is here... That is a lie. Levi is not here. But if I said, Levi is coming, someone go get Levi. Don't go get Levi. Uh, but someone go get Levi because Levi is about to be here, and I believe he's about to be here. That is something, calling something that is not, it's not right here, as though it's about to be here or is already here. Do you see the difference? It's a subtle difference. So don't lie, but call the situation. Say what it is. Hey, you know what? Things aren't going the way that I intended it to go. I don't know what's happening in life right now, but then you step immediately right over here and say, I have my shield of faith, standing completely convinced that God has my best interest at heart. I have my breastplate of righteousness. I know I didn't do anything to warrant all of this stuff coming because God is not the author of my destruction. He takes what the enemy means for evil and turns it for good, not my own personal comfort sometimes, but for good. And you stand here and you start to put on that armor and say, okay, I am saying this. But if you don't have that other armor on, all of a sudden you start to say the wrong things and you create a wrong path. That's how you start to use it. And there's two core ways, guys, right here. You can write these down. This is your homework for the week. Pray it, and then do something that we don't really use very often. Declare it. Pray it and declare it. What is the difference in prayer and declare? Or declare. <laughs> I'm not good with this language thing, guys. <laughs> I need to work on my rhema, my speech here. <laughs> but 
What is the difference in prayer and declaring something? Prayer is a petition. That's what the word prayer means in Scripture. It's the asking and communication of the thing. Declaring is repeating or saying what's already been done or said. There is a big difference in these two things, and they're both vitally important to understanding how you use this thing called the sword of the Spirit. Because if you're just over here always just asking, oh God, please, and God's saying, I already done did it, you just got to start saying what I already said. You got to start using my spirit the way I intended you to use my spirit, right? How do we know this? So let's look at prayer. How do we pray? Okay, we have a great example in Jesus showing us the Lord's Prayer, shows us how we, we, we open with thanks and, and we ask him for help and guidance and his will to be done. That's a big key portion of it. But in Ephesians 6, 18, right after it talks about the sword of spirit, it tells us right there. It says, pray with all supplication. The word supplication means with complete fervency. Play, uh, pray consistently, continually with complete verses for one another. Pray for each other and for yourselves. A lot of our prayers are, are really like Santa's wish list. We're just praying for God to help me give this and help me do this and help me do this. I challenge you this week. Here's your direct challenge for the week. Pray all week long, but never pray for one thing for yourself. Never pray for one thing for yourself. Pray for each other. That's, you got your partner still, right? We're going on week three. Y'all get to know him really well. Go have you a coffee and say, all right, what's going on? You know, if I'm going to pray for that and I'm going to pray. You know what? I know that this, and, and don't turn into gossip. Don't start using that sword of the spirit and start speaking the gossip stuff. Use it and say, God's going to fix this situation. God's going to do this. But don't pray for yourself. Pray for the other people. Pray, petition, continually asking. That's how you pray. Now, the next part is this declaring. Now, I had to shrink down declaring because it's all over scripture. Uh, and I shrunk it down to these. Joshua 1.8. Talks about praying with, uh, uh, t- talks about declaring without, see, let's just read it. Let's just read it. I want to read it. I love this one. This book of the law shall not depart from thy mouth, but I shall meditate on it day and night, and I will observe it to do according all that is written thereof, and it will make thy way prosperous, and you will have good success. We use this on the shoes of peace, if you recall. This book of the law will not depart from my mouth, but I will meditate on it. I'll keep that helm of salvation on and keep it replaying in my mind consistently, continually. And I won't depart from my mouth. That part talks about I will not quit saying it. What's been written? This is showing us the difference between written word, the Logos word of God, and the Rhema word of God. It's saying it's already been written down. His promises are already there. I've just got to keep saying it. That's what I got to keep doing. Keep saying it and convincing yourself. Keep saying it. You're the little train that could. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And then you can turn into, I know I can. I know I can. I know I can. And then he already did. He already did. He already did. That one's a little harder to say, probably. So that's Joshua 1 8. Now, Matthew 12 37 says that by your words you are justified or condemned. By the things that you declare and say, that will put you justified. I love this definition of justified. Just as if I'd. It's just as if it never happened. Or you're condemned. Think of a condemned building. You're shutting yourself in. You're stopping from the breath to be able to flow out. You're, you're going into cardiac arrest over here. Or, <coughs> or there we go. <laughs> or you could step over here in the spirit and say, I'm going to say what God says. I say that about 15,000 times to where we, that's what we go out of here remembering and saying. Now, Romans 4.17 is the, is the scripture that we talked about just a while ago that call things that be not as though they are. That is a declaration right there. A prayer is the petition and the asking saying, God, show me your will. Give me direction. Or what have you like that. Do this for them. That's the prayer. And then start to declare. Declare is the second step. First you pray, you petition, you ask, and then you begin to declare. Find it and line it up with the written word of God to where you're speaking what God is saying. That's the declaration piece of it. Now, I'm going to show you a scripture that's kind of the, the crux of this whole thing for you guys, okay? It's right here. It's Proverbs 12, 25. And this is what it says. It says, heaviness in the heart of a man makes it stoop or makes it low. Depressed is a really great word for right here. But a good word makes it glad. And if you look at what this good word is, I love to use this translation. God is good, right? It says God is love, God is good. That's what Scripture tells us. So if God is good, and it says a good word makes it glad, a God word makes it glad. Say what 
God says, because the God words will bring your heart up. If you're struggling with, with, with that helmet of salvation portion of it, you're not convinced, fully convinced that God has your best interest at heart or has your family member's best interest at heart or has any interest at heart, all you got to do is put on that helmet of salvation and remember this right here that it says... All I've got to do is say the good words and have the good words, the God words, the words that come from that book or come from the Spirit of God himself. I will speak that. I will say that. I will declare that. I will use my spirit against any enemy or against my own mind. Because remember, it's not a brutal thing. It's like a surgeon's instrument. God, I mean, David's prayed it best, right? That's why he was called a man after God's own heart. I don't look at it as like he was just like God's own heart. He was searching, seeking after God's own heart because he said, Lord, search me, try me. See if there's any wicked way in me. Take the sword of the spirit and start to divide that up in me and work it out in me so I can say what you say, so I can do what you do. So I have this stance that puts me here. Heaviness of the heart makes it stooped or depressed, but a good word, a God word, We'll make it glad. We'll make it joyous. That's why it's extremely important, and this is kind of where we're going to wrap it up. That's why the sword of the Spirit, as I said earlier, is the last piece of the armor. It's not the first one, because a lot of you say, no, 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 let's get that sword of the Spirit. I'm going to start saying it, but you don't know what to say if you're not in the right stance. If you don't have that belt of truth and say, okay, the truth is that I'm set free. If you don't have that breastplate of righteousness that says, there's nothing I can do to become this. God made me this way. I'm going to stand right here regardless of what I see around me or what people tell me or anything like that. If you don't have those shoes of peace and say, I'm going to be walking out the path that God's put before me. And when I'm walking out that path, I know he has my best interest at heart because I've got my shield of faith on. And if you don't say, hey, I put this helmet of salvation because I'm completely made whole in my mind, my body, my spirit, every beat of it, every bit of it if you don't have all of that working in and you're just saying i'm standing convinced when you go to speak the abundance of the heart the heart's not protected by the righteousness of god you're going to say the wrong things not even even not purposefully but you just don't know but ignorance is no excuse for the law <laughs> ignorance is no excuse all you got to do is just say i just stand here and then the Spirit of God can begin to speak to me. It's the position. It's the stance. Every bit of this armor. I'm kind of getting into next week a little bit. Better. Every bit of this armor is all about getting you in the right stance. Have you ever watched any kind of uh, army movies and stuff like that? What are they always working on them on? Their feet. They're always talking about, you know, people moving their hips around. They're doing all this, and they just go, and they swipe their feet right out from under them, and then they what? Fall. Every bit of the armor of God is just trying to teach you, get in the right stance. Because when you get in the right stance, this weapon works for you and not against you. You're no longer condemned. You're justified. And then you can begin to walk out what God has for your life, in your workplace, in your schools, in, in your families, wherever you are. But it all has to do with the stance that you're in. And that's the number one struggle that we're all against. The battlefield is more in your mind. There is a battle out there. There is an enemy that we need to fight against. But first, let's get, let's get our ranks together. Let's conquer the battlefield of the mind that we're in and use the sword of the Spirit to conquer that. So your challenge for the week is with your partner. If you don't have one, find one. Get the number, exchange it. So every week you've been praying for each other, you've been doing all this. I want you all to declare together. You're going to feel weird because it's not natural. It's supernatural. It's going to feel weird to say, I believe and declare something together. But that's what I want you to do every day. Declare something together. And say, we will use this sword of the Spirit to create and to walk out the path that God has given us.